everybody. Thanks so much for joining us right here for The Right View. I'm Laura Trump, and I am so excited to be joined tonight by former senior advisor to President Trump's campaign, Mercedes Schlapp, and host of The Benny Report on Newsmax. You know him and love him, Benny Johnson. Thank you guys both so much for being here. Thank Great. you, Laura. Great to be here. Can I have the Mercedes Schlapp report? I like that. It's the the. <laughs> you, Mercedes, I know. you have such better taste in artwork. Look at my walls. Blank. <laughs> Look at your wall. Beautiful Somebody send trees. Betty some pictures. Look, okay. I'm, bo I'm borrowing a friend's apartment, okay? But Betty, I think maybe you should use pronouns like his, he, Benny Johnson report. That might make uh, it even yes. more interesting. That's true. That's right. Actually, please, please uh, use Zahir is my preferred <laughs> Zare, Zare and Zahir. <laughs> Actually, I do, I do have artwork. Do you want to see? Yeah, I, I know we weren't planning yeah. on going here, but it's right here. This is a photo of Gavin Newsom shutting down the skate parks in Venice oh. Beach. It oh. hangs on my wall. It was a photographer wow. took it with the drone. And it's like the bulldozer filling in the skate park oh with sand. Gosh. Yeah. So... Wow. All it's, the artwork in the Johnson household is political. <laughs> <laughs> it's appropriate, Benny, that you bring that up because we're going to jump in and start today by talking about the fact that we have some great news coming out of states like Texas and Mississippi. The governors have lifted the mask mandate. They're allowing businesses to open at one 100% capacity. It is great news, guys. It is something that we have been waiting for almost for one year. I, I think we're a week out from like the year almost anniversary of, remember, 14 days to slow the spread. So let me start with you, Benny, since you got the artwork there. How great is this? How excited are you? And, and what is your message to governors like Gavin Newsom and others out there that are still shut down? Yeah, so I like to call them free states and tyranny states. I think that's the best nomenclature for this. Do you live in a free state? Do you live in a tyranny state? If you live in a tyranny state, you know it because it's a state yeah. that has destroyed your economy, that has ruined your ability to live, that tells you that they, that they have an unconstitutional power over you and is trying to control your life and guaranteed your children are not in school. That is is proof positive that you live in a tyranny state. If you live in a tyranny state, your life is miserable, you're sad, your governor is probably a criminal, and uh, you want to leave. Now, if you live in a free state, a free state like Texas now, but Florida, Texas yep. is just like, Texas is like coming in, getting into the hot tub, but South Dakota and Florida are like, hey, the water's great. We've, We've been, been here. Fun. Yeah, that's exactly right. But they, like, hey, listen, more to the party. Good. Mississippi as well fantastic way to go. This needs to be the dividing line. There needs to be a dividing line where these states say enough is enough with this anti-science nonsense. We are destroying our children's future. We're destroying your living future right now, your living ability. And so welcome back, open up, enough with the nonsense. Uh, and, and, and this is happening. And what you're going to see now is a flood of people to these states. You're already seeing yeah. it clearly. Um, and, uh, you know, I know Mercedes is in Florida right now. If you tried to buy a house in Florida, you can't. There's no, you can't even like everything, poof, right off the market. So bravo to these states. Good job being free states. Shame on you, tyranny states. Stop being miserable. Yeah. By the way, I happen to live in a tyranny state. I am here right now in New York in a, not only a tyranny state, but I'm physically in, I guess, a tyranny city. Uh, if whatever you want to call New York City right now, what a disaster. Uh, but Mercedes, Benny does bring up a good point. What has continued to happen all over our country with these emergency powers granted to the governors of these states it is unconstitutional. It goes against everything that our founding fathers put in the documents, you know, to, to guide our country and the future of America for us to be shut down, for people to say you cannot gather um, for religious purposes. You cannot have your businesses open. Children cannot be in school. You are forced to wear masks. All of these things are unconstitutional. And I am predicting right now that when you see states start opening up like this, like Texas and Mississippi and God bless uh, Florida and South Dakota, Benny, you're exactly right. They have been on this track for some time. Um, I think people are going to start getting really antsy in the tyranny states and they're going to start demanding the same thing of their governors. 
Well, I, I got to tell you something. It almost feels like during the time of the feminist movement, when the women were burning the bra, their bras, it's like they're going to go out and burn their mask at this <laughs> ah. point. Because what has happened is, is you've seen the constant shifting of the guideposts, right? Yeah. Fauci says you don't have to wear a mask. Then you have to wear one mask. Now we're up to two masks. It's like, you know, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. This is what we're dealing with. Oh, is it Dr. <laughs> Seuss? We can't talk Dr. Seuss, oh. right? We're going to be banned. Oh, no. Right. So, well but, done. Well done. <laughs> I'm competing with Betty. I want to see who could up it up here great. on this, that on this was show. Really good. So um, can we get a right view mug, whoever wins, Laura? Oh, so, yes, absolutely. So, uh, so, you know, I think we're at a point right now that the governors feel emboldened. They're ready to take on the federal government because they recognize that not only are the, they're, they're pe the people feeling restless, but the fact is, is that people want to live their lives. This is about choice. This is about that if you really are concerned, you are part of the vulnerable population, or you have pre-existing conditions, that you really want to say, look, I want to wear a mask. I want to stay home. I choose to even keep my yeah. kids in virtual school. That's one option. The second option is those people who want to safely go out and start dining again, start reopening up their business in a responsible way, they should be allowed to do it. What we don't need are the constant federal nanny policing of individuals that takes away our individual rights. And I believe as Americans, we are responsible and we should be able to make our own choice on what is the best thing for our family and for our communities. Yeah, absolutely right. Well, Look, we'll, we'll see what happens with the other states. Uh, I'm not holding my breath personally here in New York. I don't think that uh, that's the top of the governor's list for some reason. I think he's got some other things going on. But um, don't I hold do... your breath with a double mask mandate. You might not be able to breathe at all. I mean, this is very dangerous. <laughs> I can barely breathe in one mask, let alone Fauci saying we need two and maybe three. Three is better than two. Two is better than one. What? Seriously? How do you breathe in two or three masks? I, I honestly don't understand it. But That's neither a really good Fauci impression. Oh, thank you. I've been I've been touted for yeah. It's it's been noted that I, I can the do the difference is Laura. You're about a, several feet taller, I think, or several <laughs> or a foot taller than Fauci. Okay, Bless like let's heart. be real. <laughs> yeah, you'd well, be like little Fauci, little nailed little it. Fauci. Well, Nailed Mercy, it. I want to I want to get to CPAC because obviously CPAC was the talk of of everything over the past week or so. Kudos to you and your husband Matt. It was an incredible CPAC. I'm so sad that I couldn't be there this year, but we got to hear for the first time from Donald Trump since he left office. Uh, he talked about, you know, freedom of speech. He talked about cancel culture. He talked about how important it's going to be coming up in 22 to make sure that, you know, we reelect and, and elect people to offices all across America who stand up uh, against some of the things, the lunacy that we've seen from the left um, and really are standing up for Americans Give me your take on, on CPAC as a whole, because I think it got more coverage this year than I've ever seen, but also what we heard from President Trump. Well, first of all, uh, it, you know, I got to tell you something. It was amazing to be able to bring thousands of freedom loving Americans together. You know, it, it had been a very difficult end of the year, and there was this deep sense of hopelessness. They were looking for direction. They were looking to know what's coming next. And I think CPAC and with all the variety of speakers, we were able to tackle every single issue, primarily the main theme being America uncanceled. This cancel culture that we're seeing happening every single day, whether you go from Mr. Potato Head to gender neutral potato head, to the fact that Americans feel that they are being silenced. In fact, not only silenced, but that if you are a Trump supporter or if you are someone who supports the MAGA movement, that you are viewed as a domestic terrorist and they will do everything they can to destroy the individual. That is the goal of the left. They tried to even come and destroy CPAC with a lot of falsehoods and slanders and horrible accusations. But let me tell you, we were not distracted. We were focused because we realized that we have to continue to be a strong voice out there for those who feel that they are being silenced. And so when the president came, of course, it was such 
an amazing experience for everybody there. First of all, he showed that he is still the force of nature that he is in this Republican Party, in this conservative movement, and in the MAGA movement. He also talked about his legacy and how he built a strong and safe America and showing how weak Biden, who I don't even know where he is. It's like, first where we have where's Biden? Hunter, now we're like, where's Joe? And, and thirdly, he talked about election <laughs> reform something that the Democrats and the media refuse to let us talk about. They yeah. think, they, they don't even know what voting irregularities happen. They don't even allow us to address the issue. But I will tell you, at CPAC, at American Conservative Union, we are we're building out our center to protect elections. We're focused on election integrity. We have to start stop HR1. That is our top priority because yeah. the Democrats will do whatever they can to weaken voting systems across the country because they want utter control in all these different states. So the president really was just came at the right time. We needed to hear his voice. We all came out with full of energy, spirit, direction, ready to take on the left and stop them. And that was, I think, what we were able to accomplish at this conference and what we'll continue to do as in, in this upcoming year as well. And by the way, for our audience, H.R. 1 is the bill that I continue to talk about on this show. They call it like a voting rights bill or some nonsensical name like that. It's it's the, a bill that that wants more vote by mail. They want uh, automatic voter registration. They want no voter ID. They want earlier, early voting, all kinds of really outrageous, egregious things that that would make the transparency of elections almost zero as if. We didn't have a big enough problem this past election with the transparency and with what was obviously, you know, an election that a lot of people felt like they had major problems with. Benny, I want to ask you, um, you know, the, it was the whole kind of uh, CPAC vibe was about cancel culture and, and uncancel, you know, culture. Um, we really have come to a place, I think, where I personally am worried that our children, that Luke and Carolina, that Eloise, your daughter, that the future of America is going to be a less free place. They will be, it's, it's maybe the first time that they will have less freedom than generations before them. Because when you're talking about canceling Dr. Seuss, when you're talking mm -hmm. about canceling Mr. Potato Head, my gosh, it feels like ages ago that they wanted to cancel Paw Patrol, which don't even get me started on how my son would have reacted to that nonsense. Um, it, it's a really frightening path. And I don't know what the end goal is. How, how, how are they gonna be happy? When will they be happy with this cancel mm -hmm. culture? There's no such thing as happiness on the left, so that's really important. You have to identify, you have to identify emotions that they are capable of having. Okay, there's three: seething, venomousness, and crying into their lattes like salty, salty big tears. All right, because you offended them, or I offended them, or we had a joke, or we had fun. There are no emotions of happiness left on the left. This is really valuable, and the reason why the lack of humor on the left is so egregious to our political landscape is because humor is a binding force. It's a healing force. When you laugh with someone, your brain gets a rush of oxytocin, serotonin. You actually bond with them. You become able to see someone else when you can laugh at their flaws, when you can see them as human beings. And so when you look at late night or SNL or comedy of the left these days and you see how vicious and unfunny it actually is mm -hmm. and you look at a party completely removed a party that has removed their funny bone that has removed their ability to laugh at each other at their fellow Americans it becomes a very sad and dehumanizing party and that sucks it sucks because you need that to have a country you have, if you just go back a couple of years ago, the ability to laugh at each other is one of the ties that binds in America. Now, why can't they laugh? This is really important. You can't laugh because laughter is based on truth. A priest, a minister, and a rabbi walk into a bar. That's funny because there's a nugget of truth in there. You're going to laugh because there's something in there that's going to ring true for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you have no truth, if you're completely morally relativistic, if you don't have any truth and you've abandoned truth for uh, something that is, again, morally relevant, you don't have humor. There's no core for you to have anything funny to laugh at. Worse yet, you can't laugh because you might offend someone because your That's truth right. might not be their truth. Their truth might offend you. That's why the left says silence is violence. 
It's why the left says speech is violence. Everything is violence. Everything is offensive. And so you can't, if, in that kind of a cage, it's where you get the modern left. An unfunny, sad, vicious people. And that's not the American tradition. That's not the American way. And that's not what's going to keep this country firm and strong. A happy, united, passionate America that can laugh at itself. That's a country that's unbreakable. That's the conservative future that we want. Yeah, and that's what they don't want on the left. They are terrified that somehow we will all be united by something. Um, great, great points on that. I never thought of it that way. They probably can't be very happy on the left. I mean, oof, <laughs> even they, in they, victory, they yeah. want what right? So you could say, oh, you want everything. Are they happy? I mean, no, look, you're I, right. It's all it's all about the cookie cutter approach, right? If you don't fit into the cookie cutter approach, then that makes you then you, then you're not going to be accepted. Right. You're not going to be accepted by the elites of the left. I mean, Laura, you all know this, what they've tried to do Don't to try wait. to destroy your family. Yeah. And what and, and so it's all about isolation and it's all about uh, you're not good enough to be with us. And so what happens is, is that you're having this huge dis divide amongst the elites and so many of these corporations and big tech that are trying to cancel us and real Americans, the forgotten men and women that are saying, where's my America that I love, that I can stand up and pledge allegiance to my flag and pray in my churches and raise my children with, uh, with real American values of our God-given rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These Democrats, these socialists, they have no respect for our constitution. They want to rip it up into shreds, just like Nancy Pelosi ripped that State of the Union yep. speech. That is what the left embraces. Yep. And if we can't understand that and if we can't push back and if we can't speak up, it will be the end of America as we know it. Well, I'll I just want you... to take a moment yeah, to go ahead, compliment Mercedes and Matt because at CPAC, there were so many joyous people. I follow this stuff very closely on the Internet. Uh, I, there are so many joyous, happy people there. The yeah. golden Trump statue, the memes, the funny signs, the amazing outfits. It was just a it's a party of joy. It's a party of happiness. Being yep. an American, the experience of being an American is being a happy person and having that that happiness comes from the ability to choose and be free and bravo for having it in Florida. But you would have thought that Republicans had won every seat in Congress plus the presidency into eternity watching CPAC right this year because people were happy. They were joyous. But if you were to tune in right now to any leftist march, you'd find nothing but visceralness and anger, even though they could notch up some big wins in 2020. And so it really is a a schism of uh, that happens in your soul. And it's about your worldview. And it really is. It's fascinating to see the difference. Bravo. I just want to say bravo to you and Matt for putting on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, happy, it's true. Thing. Really amazing job. And it really it, you know what, Benny, to your point. It's sort of how Trump rallies always were. Everyone happy at a Trump rally. Every It was like a party. Everyone yes. welcoming, yeah. happy to be there. People waiting in line for days in yes. the rain, in the cold, in the heat, whatever it was. They were happy to be there. They were happy to be an American. They were happy to be a part uh, of something like that. And, and it felt like, you're right, I think the same thing at CPAC. But Mercedes said something a minute ago that I wanted to go back to because I'll tell you who's done a great job um, is Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, on so many fronts. But one of the things that he has done is he has pushed back on the big tech companies who have been trying to silence conservatives. He's saying, we need to hold you accountable. And by the way, President Trump said the same thing in his speech at CPAC. He talked about the fact that, look, all the election integrity measures in the world will mean nothing if we don't have freedom of speech. And if Republicans can be censored for speaking the truth and calling out corruption, he said, we will not have democracy. We will only have left wing tyranny. And he is so right. And, and Benny, I feel like you're you're kind of my go to online guy. When I have any questions about that, I always ask you because you're so great at it. But conservatives have been silenced. We have seen this happen time and time again. And we have to push back on this. We cannot remain, you know, just at the mercy of these big tech companies because where does it, uh, you know, it's sort of like cancel culture. Where does this end? And and I don't know if it does. I think you can say whatever you want online as long as they agree with it. 
Right. It's very close to the Ayatollah. It's more it's more in line with the Ayatollah's Iran or Xi's China than it would be with the principles of our founders. If our founders have had 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 social media and you were writing the First Amendment, do you think for a second that they wouldn't think that that First Amendment applies to right. social media? Um, of course not. Uh, you would have a free and open exchange of ideas. That was the point of freedom of speech, assembly, religion, the idea that the government and a corporate oligarchy couldn't crush you and destroy your ability to speak. And I think this is so important. It's something that I, is missed on a lot of people uh, that don't live and breathe digital like I do. If you were on the phone with your mom and someone was listening in on that conversation and they didn't like the joke you told your mother and they cut your phone lines, you would think that was outrageous. I mean, that would be a wild story. People would write that. All, it would be the front page. It would page be news. almost oh, communist, like, Benny. What? Like they're listening to our phone conversations and they're, I can't talk to my mom. And wait, wait, Benny, are you telling, I got to know, your mother has never hung up the phone on you. I'm sure your mother has hung up the phone on you. Okay. Has Dana been talking to you, Mercedes? Because <laughs> yes, that happened just last night. And it was because of a terrible joke I told about Joe Biden wearing a diaper. So I, I just, I don't, I, I do not, I do not think that Americans would stand for that. But what they have to realize is that it's the same thing that they're doing to conservatives online right now because it is our way to speak. You, de you deperson someone. You dehumanize them. Back to the dehumanization, the mm -hmm. lack of humor, the lack of a sense of humor. I deal in memes. I say often the left can't meme because they don't have a sense of humor and they have no truth. But now memes are becoming illegal online. The internet is built off of memes. It's built right. off of this exchange of ideas and comedy. And so when you take those away and you dehumanize people and you deperson people, you shrink their worldview and you marginalize them. And what we've seen in the past, and I'll end with this, what we've seen in the past is that if you are on the side of the book burners and the censors, you are on the bad side. You That's are on right. the evil side. You are not on the side of freedom. You are not on the side of Americanism, certainly. Uh, and 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 so do not be on that side. And so I implore people to write the ship on these social media networks. Otherwise, we just we will be left with nothing more than the 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 necessity to be create a parallel a parallel universe of social existence uh, because it is so important in the modern era. Yeah, uh, Benny, you're so right. And I'm gonna. I, I saw somebody post this yesterday. Mercedes, let me get your reaction to this because it is so true. Name one time in human history when the group fighting to ban books and censor speech were the good guys. I'll wait, right? I know, it, it really makes me nervous. And I, I have a sophomore uh, in high school right now and I was helping her study for her midterms and we all went through the World War II era and we studied the propaganda, we studied you know, Nazis, Hitler, going through that whole period of time, Stalin, um, uh, Lenin, we went through that whole period of time. And, you know, you never want to think that communism will come here to America. You never want to think that socialism would come here to America because we are the beacon of freedom, because we are built on such a strong constitutional foundation. But when you are talking about that you're banning books and where yeah. you're having so many people in agreement with that mentality, it's a bit of a mob mentality from the left where they just fall in line mm. and it makes you so worried that you're like, mm. what our country thrives on is diversity of thought and exchange of opinions mm -hmm. and debate. And that is that is where I think you're seeing more and more the two sides, you know, get in their corners and saying we can't work together to do great things. Uh, and so I, I really take note of understanding and for Americans to understand, read your history. I mean, my parents who came from Cuba, we saw it, he, they, my parents saw it clearly. You know, Castro came in, they took away their arms, they took away their guns. You know, he made these false promises. Uh, he ended up controlling the schools, taking over businesses, uh, controlling what people can and cannot do. And then quickly you lose your country. Yep. And so I do think we have safeguards in place and checks and balances in place that help in the U.S. But when you are changing voting systems to favor your party, we won't win an election. And let me well, tell you something. If we lose a governorship in Texas in the future, we're done because that's exactly where they're going to hone in and, and make sure that these changes in the voting systems are made.
Yeah, we're going to talk about that uh, a lot more, actually, in our next segment. But just to wrap up this thought, isn't it interesting, guys, that there are so many calls on the left to basically erase our history. They want to teach a different history of America and the world to the kids in schools today. If you leave it up to the folks on the left, they probably don't want them to, to read about all the things that you were studying with your daughter, because that's a, a surefire way not to replicate the mistakes of the past is to read about it and learn from it. Yet they want to take that away from uh, the future of America. I got to tell you, it is one of the biggest things I think about and my husband thinks about all the time. Where are we sending our children to school and what will they be learning in school? It, it couldn't be more important. Um, I know to us, Mercedes, Benny, same thing to you guys. Um, but I want to tell our audience, stay with us. We're going to take one quick break. We will be back with so much more with Betty and Mercedes right after this. Welcome back to The Right View. So here uh, with Benny and Mercedes, guys, I, I got to ask you, and Mercedes, maybe this question should go to you because you were the mom of quite a few young ladies yourself, but Joe Biden is working against women. I, I don't think it's ever been any clearer that any forward progress uh, for women that was made over the past 30, 40 years, especially in sports, has been erased with the stroke of a pen, thanks to Joe Biden. Um, you know, President Trump talked about this in his speech at CPAC. He said young girls and women are incensed that they are now being forced to compete against those who are biological males. It's not good for women. It's not good for women's sports, which has worked so long and so hard to get where they are. And it's so true as a, a I say it all the time, a, a woman that grew up playing sports, I can't think of something more upsetting than knowing I was going to have to compete against a biological male. Maybe we should just take the word biological out, just a male. I mean, it's crazy, but the president, President Trump is right. What Joe Biden has done with his executive order um, it's really scary for women. Right. And I think, look, this is a very important issue. And I think when it comes to the fact that this is what the left's going to do again, they're going to want to say that if you say something negative about those who are transgender, that you're, you know, that you're, you're a sexist, you're a homophobe, that's where they're going to go. So they're going to attack you personally. Right. So you need to be prepared for that. But I think it's really important to take this from the position of saying, look, as parents, and I have five daughters, as you mentioned, one of them is a very competitive lacrosse player in high school. Uh, and she's even told me, she said, mom, if you have a biological male playing against me, there's no way just from a physical strength standpoint. Right. Um, it, it just does, I mean, the science is there. It just simply does not work. So, let, so the Democrats use selective science, right? So they have the one science for That's COVID right. and then another science when it comes to the transgender issue. And what's very concerning is when you have a, one of their picks for HHS who happens to be transgender pushing also this agenda of children, you know, making sure that children get to choose their gender at such young ages. My favorite tweet, and I love usually a lot of Benny Johnson's tweets, but this, this one was, and this was what was from just a young lady who said, so you could choose, so these children can choose their gender, but they cannot choose to read Dr. Seuss. Right. And I thought that was brilliant. I'm like, that's right. So let's cause confusion for these children that the government's imposing, instead of having the parents really lead that discussion with their children, and then on top of that, now we have to deal with this very, very aggressive agenda of the Biden administration putting these biological males first above women and the girls who play these sports, who let me tell you, many of them work years and years and train right. constantly to even try to get a college scholarship that are now going to be taken away by these biological males. And that well, is just simply wrong. And it's it's already started happening. In Connecticut, two biological male athletes won a combined 15 girls' state championship races, uh, allegedly taking opportunities for further competition and scholarships 
from female runners, and that was just in June of 2019, um, we're going to see this happen more and more. But Benny, I don't think the problem is that anybody has an issue with how someone wants to identify themselves. You can identify as a turkey for all I care. We believe as conservatives, you live your life how you want. I'm going to live my life how I want. The problem becomes when you insist and you, you make it mandatory that people that these these biological males are forced to compete against young women and you have a daughter and i i can only think if your daughter you know gets into sports one day this could be a real problem for her yeah that's right so what happens here is in this argument and i want to have this argument on the base i think we don't have the argument the right way as conservatives i think that this argument is one that needs to be framed correctly because it has nothing to do with individualism. And the, right. your setup for that is completely correct. Conservatives believe in individualism. We believe in your ability to go off to the mountains, find yourself a patch of grass, and live however you wish. That's actually implicit in your DNA as an American. It's a wonderful nation. Go be you. The single rule is that you are not allowed to then in, in, incur on my freedom. Right. So that's what we're asking. Do not come in and incur on my freedom and take away my freedoms and my opportunities. Your freedom ends where my freedom begins and you are not allowed to take and seed ground for me or even worse, you want to get me hot and uh, you want to get me hot here for my daughter. So I'm a girl dad. I'm a girl dad. I'm a proud girl dad. She's <laughs> 7 months old. She's cute as a button. Now, she'll grow up. Maybe she'll be an athlete. Her mother's an athlete. What will happen to her? What kind of a world do I want to leave for her? I'm, again, not going to argue on the individualism. I'm going to argue this. You cannot be a feminist if you are for these policies. Because being a feminist means you must have something to protect. There must be femininity to protect. There, the term female must matter. There must be a de- delineation between female and male, and we must be able to protect these classes individually. And so if you think that you're a feminist, but you're also for these policies, you are living in a duality. And it's a duality that's going to destroy itself. And so yep. if you are a feminist, you must be against this, because what you're doing in this I- implicitly is destroying the idea of femininity and destroying what it is to be female. As a father, I want my daughter to grow up with protections. Now, here is the reality. I do not want biological, I do not want males being allowed to go into my daughter's bathroom or changing room K through 12. That is what this bill does. I think if you were to do a poll of the American people and to ask fathers or mothers that question alone, you would find 99% saying, "Mm -mm, no, like, no, that's, this isn't the way that it should work. And I don't feel comfortable with that. And, and those basic levels then you start to really show how radical and insane this is, but also how much harm you could potentially do to our children. And the question is the same as it always is. Like, what is the purpose? For me, my life, my purpose is leaving a better America for my children, for my daughter right now. And in, in, for, on those grounds, on those grounds, yes, I want an America where being a feminist or being feminine is valued and is protected. And that's why I deeply, deeply oppose this type of legislation. And if if I can add, for the Democrats and for the far left, this is about blurring the lines. This is about getting rid of the gender terms. It's where they're headed. Okay, so this concept of female and male, they only use it in a man when they say a man and a woman, uh, when they did, (laughs) as that pastor did. And the other thing I want to say is I, I give credit to these Republican governors who have stood up against this, 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 on this issue of, of allowing biological men to play in women's sports or girls' sports. They, you have, you know, close to 29 states basically saying, we're going to ban this, we're not going to allow this in our, our states. And it shows more and more, I know we focus so much on the federal elections, but why state elections matter, mm-hmm. while right. local elections matter, and why we need to make sure that we have Republicans, good Republicans on the ticket on the tickets yep. so that they can win. Yeah. yeah. Well, Do you think a preferred is a preferred pronoun preferred? Because a preference is just like what you want at dinner. Like, do you, is a preferred or is it mandatory? Like they're not saying, they're not saying true. this as preferred. It's a mandatory pronoun. Yeah. So you have, you know, again, it comes back to what the point Mercedes just made 
is about federalism. It's about freedom. And it's about encroaching on someone else's freedom. That's the issue here. That's what separates it from so many other issues that the left uh, is pushing right now. And really, I think it is truly about the depersoning of human beings. And uh, in the end, that in the end, that is the goal. Uh, is yes. that there's no difference between all of us. And we all know what that leads to. Yeah. Well, by the way, I, and I think another point that you brought up, Mercedes, which is, we, we touched on in our last segment, it's really important that we get elections right. It's very important that we have transparency in our elections. It's very important that all of the changes that were made, again, uh, under the guise of COVID in the past year um, uh, across the country in so many states we need to change those back. We should have voter ID. We should know that whoever goes to vote is a legal citizen of America. We should know that they are of age, that they are the person they say they are, and that they are exercising their right to vote. And, and you know, there is no funny and business going that on. that they're alive, that they're not dead. Oh, How about that? that? Also, an the important polls thing. should be helpful. To know, but but President Trump talked about this as well in his speech um, at CPAC <laughs> about uh, election reform and integrity and making sure that we get this right. And you're right, it's not just about the presidential election level. Look, we saw how important you know a, a Senate race was in Georgia. That was the focus of everybody, but when you get down to it, it was the state legislatures in each of these states that had the ability to to change the the rules of the election per state every election is important but but guys i think this is probably the biggest focus right now as far as i'm concerned for conservatives because if we allow the democrats to do what they want if they if they get to change our electoral process republicans are never going to win another election i think they know that especially in 22 if things were fair and everything was transparent and, and we voted in an appropriate way, Republicans would wipe the floor with Democrats. I think that we would take back the House and the Senate. And I think that that is one of the reasons they are pushing this so hard. Uh, Benny, let me get your thoughts. Uh, anyone who tells you that election integrity is not number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven on the priority list for your average grassroots um, Republican and conservative is lying to you. And any Republican official right now who isn't taking one through 10 as the priority and working day in and day out to, for to make sure that our elections are hardened and to make sure that Americans are enfranchised. That is the messaging here. You must speak about enfranchising people because when you do not enfranchise people, when you take away their vote, you undergird what our democracy is all about. This representation only, our representative democracy and our republic only work if people feel like they are heard. This goes all the way back to everything that we've been talking about on this show. It goes all the way back to humor and it goes all the way back to personhood in our, in our country. If you feel like your vote can be canceled out uh, either by, either by uh, illegal means or by not counting correctly, it, it takes away the institution of the vote, and that's so valuable. So this is the only issue that is, that is crucial to Republicans. It's the only motivating factor that I see when I'm out communicating with people. Um, and Republicans really, really need to get it serious, and you're exactly right. The stakes could not be more dire. Yeah, and Mercedes, I know that, that you guys are working on this. This is something I think you're actively involved with. Um, you must hear it constantly that this is probably the biggest concern to people out there. What I never want to hear from people is, well, my vote doesn't count. And, you know, we hear that in states like where I am right now in New York. You know, oftentimes Republicans won't even go bother to vote because they say, well, my vote doesn't count. I'm afraid now that people are going to start saying, well, it doesn't even matter because we know that they're just the, the rules that they put on, you know, in place, the Democrats, uh, it's just going to cancel out my vote. I mean, I assume that you are working actively to make sure that never happens. Absolutely. I, I just want to say, I think it's really important for any of your viewers to read that Time magazine article of the plotting and planning by yeah. the left and by the Biden lawyers and by all these leftist coalition groups to undermine the election. Because that's exactly what they did. They worked on changing the voting systems in these key states like Nevada, you look at Georgia and it was a, a, you know, a secret deal by Stacey Abrams and Governor Kemp from Georgia 
where they put these consent decrees in place uh, that really led to a weakened uh, verification system where you ended up with unsolicited mail-in ballots and then you couldn't verify the signatures. It's very problematic. And the reality is in many of these states, when you look at Nevada, when you look at Georgia, when you look at Pennsylvania, these election files are corrupt, meaning the names don't match the address, which in essence means that they are not following election code. But what did the judges do? It doesn't have standing, so we're not going to touch it because it's a political firestorm. So the judges did not review the evidence in so many of these cases. And so our goal with this new center that's being launched at ACU, the Center to Protect Elections, is to work with the state legislatures, come up with that guideline with the right type of election reform laws that we need to ensure that if you're a legal voter, then you can legally vote. And if it's one voter, it's one vote. And not allow for these shenanigans of three or four ballots being sent to Benny Johnson's house, you know, and then Benny fills them all out and sends them in. Which happens. For, Which happens. You know, so our and, house... Our house used to be a rental house, and it uh, we had yep. multiple ballots sent. There were stacks of them, and this happened all throughout our neighborhood. I live in Washington D.C. They just mailed you ballots willy nilly; you don't have to request them. And this happened all throughout my neighborhood, where people would have stacks of ballots this thick for people who didn't live there, and there was absolutely nothing to stop them from filling them out and sending them right back in. Or how That's about right. how about dead cats? I, I I love to bring this up, Cody Tim's. They, dead cats voting, they have, they're sending ballots to all these different, you know, uh, animals that, that have, you know, human-like names. It, it's crazy. This stuff is, it's really outrageous. But look, I think that, that 2022 is going to be a really big year for conservatives. And we have to think about what, what does the future look like for the Republican Party, ultimately. I think a lot of these rhinos are going to be held accountable in 22. I think they're going to be primaried um, by people who are, are freedom-loving Americans who who feel like they got a raw deal in 2020. They feel like that things weren't exactly right with this election. They feel like more should be done to keep this the freest country and, as you said, Mercedes, a beacon of hope to all of those around the world facing tyranny and oppression. We need good leaders to come forward and run for these offices. Uh, but let me ask each of you to, to give me your thoughts about what you would like to see ultimately happen for the future of the Republican Party, because I think that we could be the envy of everybody. I think, you know, the, the future is ours to take. We could have the youth vote going forward. We could we could make this the best party because we know it is the best party. We know it's the only way forward. Benny, give me your thoughts. What what mm -hmm. can Republicans do? What's the future of this party look like? Mm -hmm. And the message of your father-in-law is a winning message that plays out in the data, like far and away. And I know there are going to be a lot of people that say, oh, well, yeah, but what happened in 2020? Wait a second. Wait, hold on. Full stop record scratch. Let's look at the actual data. So Donald Trump got more votes as a sitting president than any American in human history, any president that ever ran in human history, not by a little margin, by an enormous margin. Now, where do those votes come from? The working class, something that the yep. Republican Party has struggled to win for a long, long time. The era of the silk stocking Republican is done. The George H.W. Bush, God rest his soul, God bless his soul, that era is done. The country club Republican era is done. And we should welcome that because the working class deserves a voice in this country and is a very powerful voice. They expanded by double double digits, the working class vote in the Republican Party, the work that you did on the trail, the work that you did on the trail, Mercedes, all of that played out. Those numbers are real and it increased with Hispanics and with black Americans. And so this is the Republican Party I've dreamed of. This is fantastic. Like as a 34 year old, I've always wanted a Republican Party that was large and big tent. I was always told that it was big tent. That was a lie. Now it actually is true. And the numbers reflect that. The 2020 election reflects that. And so does Kevin McCarthy's wins and flipping of seats mm -hmm. and winning of every toss up, holding of his caucus and the, re the retaining of the Senate before the special. That is pretty incredible. And so if you look at the populist, the populist and America first policies going forward, they're winning policies for the Republican Party. And I beg every Republican out there right now to look at what worked and what expanded the Republican base and embrace it. I couldn't agree more. Mercedes, you know, Benny's right. We we were out on the campaign trail. We saw the change taking place because everywhere we went, 
we saw what an inclusive party the Republican Party had become, that people were coming out to vote for the first time ever as Republicans. I think we're going to see that continue. And look, it, it has only taken Joe Biden, what, 38, 39 days in office so far to show us exactly why we warned everybody about putting him in office. We said if you elect Joe Biden, he would destroy America and take it down. He's doing it every single day. The more gas prices go up, the less safe we feel as Americans, the more he puts America last. I think we have an opportunity over the next two and four years to bring even more people into this party. I do agree. I think a big focus needs to be on the uh, suburban mom. I mean, really, mm -hmm. truly, I think where we hurt and where we got plummet, plummet, plummeted was uh, with the college educated men and women. And so really going into those groups and talking to them about what's at stake, you know, the issues that they care about. I know we talked about, you know, the sports issue with transgender athletes. That is something that is impactful to talk about. The reopening up of schools. I've never seen so many liberals and independents yelling, saying, please, 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 my kid has to go to school because my kid's depressed. He doesn't have any friends. He can't see his friends. Also talk about the fact that we were the ones, and it was President Trump who worked on getting, a, you know, two vaccines passed and approved, uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed, where it led to many more therapeutics, that he was on the ball when it came to COVID. And that at the end of the day, it was his economic policies that led to a strong and prosperous and safe America and the border policies. What we're starting to see at the border is something that we got to keep an eye on, where you're having more and more unaccompanied minors coming to the border, where they're running out of space already. And we're yeah. on day, what did you say, 36 or 37 of the Biden administration? You're going to see a full-blown border crisis in no time. And the DHS, Department of Homeland Security Secretary, said, wait, there is no border crisis. So I really believe the more we can educate on the issues uh, and, and really reach out to that group of of the suburban mom and dad that really abandoned the president and the Republican Party and our natural Republican allies, that's mm -hmm. going to be critical in states, especially mm -hmm. like Arizona, Nevada, uh, Georgia, and, and really looking into these different states that we need to win in 2022. Absolutely right. Um, I couldn't have said it better. I want to say thank you to, to both of my guests, Benny Johnson, Mercedes Schlapp. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, what a great discussion we had. And there's so much more to come. So you can tune right back in here next week for more of The Right View. Until then, we will say goodbye and we will see you next time.